There it is. Ready? Give it, give and, it for your record. And if you have $200 on eBay, you could probably find one of these. This is the only copy I have. But you could probably find one of these, Haystacks Balboa on Polydor, 1970. There the guys. Still play with this guy. Saw this guy play the other night at the bitter end. So these are also the uh, rest in peace, swindler. The rest of the guys are, you know, anyway. Haystacks Balboa, claim right. to fame. And you can hear them on Spotify for free. Yes, you can hear them on Spotify for free. <laughs>the music that resonated in your household in your youth? Well, growing up, uh, neither of my parents were musicians, oh. but there was a piano in the house and they were dancers. So if you'd go to a wedding or a bar mitzvah, and there were a lot of them in those yeah. days, my parents would just, you know, cut the rug. They would be on the dance floor the whole night. And, and for, you know, it was very surprising to me because I didn't really think of them in that light. Mm. But there were a lot of LPs in the house with just a very poor stereo system that I can even remember. <laughs> But they, uh, I remember at one point, it must have been the rage to learn all the Latin dancers, mm -hmm. dances. Mm. So my parents were chacho, cha-cha and merengue and mambo and all of those things. And they were like, they would do it in the living room. So it was a very musical house. You got and, a great musical education because you, young Mark, is hearing all these grooves. Yes, all the grooves. And also, they were from the era of the big bands where they used to dance. So they, I think they probably met dancing like in Brooklyn, you know, mm -hmm. one of those. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a very musical house. And um, uh, it, it was very natural for, to, for me to, you know, start playing something. All right, well, let's talk about the formation of the legendary Haystacks Balboa. Okay. How did yeah. that come to fruition, the great Haystacks? Well, uh, I had uh, been playing in this group called the Innovation Umbrella. We were playing up in the Catskills for two seasons, and I was like 16 and 17, and uh, when that band started to get a little looser, uh, we brought in a keyboard player named Lloyd Landsman, um, who was uh, from Forest Hills, because the guitar player I was playing with at the time was from Forest Hills, mm -hmm. so Lloyd came over, a very good musician at the time, and we did a few rehearsals, and I don't even recall if we ever really played a gig, and then because the guitar player fell in love with the singer's friend, one of these stories. Um, that, that, something like that, yeah. <laughs> that band dissolved pretty quick. And Lloyd, who had been playing in a band um, at Forest Hills High School called Tangerine Puppets, he went back to that band and brought me along as the bass player. Now at that time, that band was at the infancy of Haystacks Balboa. Mm. They were rehearsing in a basement in the drummer's house um, in Forest Hills. And, um, Larry West from The Vagrants was kind of sitting in and he, he was writing a few things for them. And, but they, I think they really wanted a real bass player. And Lloyd dragged me along and we rehearsed all summer in a hot basement, eating veal parmesan sandwiches, you know, five, probably five days a week. And uh, then uh, we, we got signed, we, we caught some breaks. Well, um, we, we had a, a connection to the Vagrants because right. of the neighborhood and Mark Mayo, the guitar player, um, was a good friend of Leslie West's. And they were managed by a guy named Shelley Finkel mm -hmm. who went on to get into boxing and manage, uh, he managed Mike Tyson and mm -hmm. Mark Breland. And we made a demo at a place called Charles Lane on the west side. We made like a four or five song demo. We brought it to Shelley, who brought it around, and we got signed. We got signed to Polydor. Now, this was probably favors owed, you know. It was all connections, as it always is. And we went and um, we got signed, and they were going to put together this whole package for the label, and they brought Shadow Morton out of retirement to produce the album because uh, legend has it in our circle was he needed the money because he wanted to buy an Excalibur, which was this exotic car at the time. 
Well, Shadow would pick on me a lot because um, I was, you know, I was very short as, uh, uh, you know, as the best bass players are. And he would, you know, tease me incessantly. You know, he's going, yeah, break your glasses, you know, stuff like that. And um, he was slowly, at the beginning, I know he was just really there just as for the gig, mm. but he slowly kind of got into the project. He, he sings on one of the songs. Okay. Um, he, we had some famous sessions where we would pitch quarters against the wall. Mm. And he definitely kind of uh, became one of the guys for that short, short period uh, out on Long Island. Then when the record came out, he brought us to his house for a barbecue and to see the car, and we never heard from him again. <laughs> um, but it was, he, he was a big personality mm. and definitely uh, he, he controlled that, that, the, the sessions. Mm. He, 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 had, he had ideas. And for a record that was, in fact, made by a bunch of young guys, um, you know, who were really, you know, learning their instruments, but we could play. Mm. We could play. We, 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 uh, we weren't terrible. Maybe the record is, but I mean, no. you know. Um, <laughs> and I think this was like a big gang adventure with him and with us. And um, then uh, this package, uh, we were... We were signed to premier talent and then um right you toured with major 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 acts, acts. i mean the first uh, the first big show we did if uh, my memory serves me right is we opened up for 10 years after mm. um south mountain arena in new jersey which was like oh my god <laughs> 10 years after you know you, you had just seen these guys at fillmore and yep. and here we were and it was just in, insanely great and mm. i was going to queen's college at the time mm. and some friends came out from school to see us and this was you know this was just unbelievable and then we, um, the uh, big show that summer was we opened up for Jethro Tull uh, Schaefer Festival mm -hmm. in Central Park, uh, which was also very memorable. And we we toured, um, we toured with uh, Faces, uh, the opening right. when Rod just joined them. We were the opening act on uh, the Faces tour in 1970, and we probably did maybe about eight or nine gigs mm -hmm. with with them. And that was you know uh, cloud nine. Um, we, our, f our first show with them was at Goddard College in Vermont, mm -hmm. in the woods, which was like a real hippie school. <laughs> and that was the first time we met them. And they, we were in some dorm room where we were sleeping, and they came down the hall, and who could believe that this was Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood? Because I was a major Jeff Beck group mm -hmm. fan. Sure. So this was like dream come true. Jeff Beck, by the way. <laughs> and this was like a major dream come true. And we knew that we were going to be on a whole bunch of dates with these guys, where mm -hmm. they would play throughout the week and every weekend we would get in a car and drive to wherever the venue was and join up with them because we were going to school, we were in college. Mm -hmm. And one weekend we drove 11 hours to Chicago or Detroit and the next weekend we drive 13 hours to Detroit or yeah, Chicago. Sure. And we did a whole tour like that. Um, you know, it was the opening act uh, on some really amazing venues, opening up for uh, groups that were Huge. They, now they were the they were showmen. What did you learn from watching the faces? Well, the, night after night. I, night after night was the key. Yeah. Night after night, these guys left it all out there. Mm -hmm. They were great. They were a real party, rollicking yeah, band, and and um, the audience would go crazy. And I, strangely, the song I remember most was he was doing. Maybe I'm amazed. Right. And. That was just, you know, chilling. And we would, you know, we'd be in the wings or we'd be somewhere listening. We listened a lot. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, this, this was like how it was supposed to be done. And, you know, the next morning we were most often in the same hotel as them. The next morning we would, you know, see them fighting with people on buffet lines and, <laughs> and things like that. And um, we, uh, we did this for maybe about eight or nine different weekends where wow. we would, join up all through the Midwest and uh, we never really ended up on the western part of the tour um, like our itinerary said Hollywood Bowl opening for the faces but um, the, the we didn't get enough gigs to support the mm -hmm. trip out there so the, yeah. the band never went right. which was kind of a heartbreaker but it was um, one of those situations that after you've done that as a kid yeah, you're you, you're you're not stopping you're not stopping <laughs> and you figured that if this is if this is the launching pad one day you are going to be like that. Thank you for watching part one of Tom's interview with Mark Pollitt. Be sure to join us for part two next time here on Know Your Bass Player. <laughs>